I wanted to buy the best new example of what internal combustion has to offer. So I drove nine new cars over the course of four weeks and 8,000 miles to come up with the answer. The MX-5 does not compromise. You do. And that core principle is what makes this stand out against virtually any other new car. Everything this does focuses on a dopamine rush. Almost any other aspect takes the metaphorical back seat. The car I almost bought was the Honda Civic Type R. And before you ask, I did find one for MSRP. Shout out to Penske Honda of Indianapolis. The Civic is more capable. It has an excellent shifter, super sharp handling, really comfortable seats, a big back seat, a big trunk, a good sound system, strong resale value. So why am I replacing my GR Corolla with this? Like with most decisions, I first had to decide what is most important to me. The Honda does do everything pretty well, but it's also 33% heavier and much longer than this. The MX-5 chassis was designed from the ground up to be a sports car. That alongside a 2,400 pound curb weight makes the MX-5 react with fluidity. It's as if it has direct access to your stream of consciousness. The Honda does have quicker steering and this has pronounced body roll. However, this is more precise and it comes with this eagerness to rotate that is so hard for other vehicles to recreate. Make small changes to the throttle or brake and that has an effect on where the car goes. For 2024, they've retuned the ramp angles of the limited slip differential, and this allows it to be a little bit more stable on corner entry. You do have some feedback from the front end. The steering weight builds up so well. And with the car being a soft featherweight, it's kind of nice how this communicates physics without really punishing you. Though when you're on the track, I have noticed that it can be a bit more of a handful, especially if you get it sideways. While I probably won't do it immediately, I think I will upgrade the suspension when I start pushing it more. The Civic Type R is a phenomenal driving car, especially for something that's based on a commuter hatchback, but you feel less involved. You're not really working alongside the car, you're more so just managing it. Another thing that I really loved about this was the transmission, especially the shifter. Why? Well, you get a lot of mechanical feedback, and on top of that, it's still light and pretty easy to operate. Some might actually prefer how the Honda shifts. It's got a smoother action to it, still fairly satisfying, very precise. This is just more raw, and the same goes for the clutch. Now, some people just heard me praising the transmission and thought, oh, well, aren't these having failing transmissions left and right? Well, after scouring forums and then double checking with NHTSA complaints, most people do not run into problems with their transmissions. Could Mazda have built them to withstand more power and hard abuse better? Yes. Is the quality control perfect? No. I'd be lying if I said the transmission is as trustworthy as the engine. But after digging into it, it's just not something I'm worried about. Also, I think this powertrain gets bonus points for having an engine that revs up nice and quick and pedals that are well spaced for heel toe downshifts. The two liter naturally aspirated inline four has the character that I used to love with old Honda VTEC engines. It loves to be at the top of the tack. I definitely think a, a nice intake or exhaust would be a good investment as I'd like to hear more of this engine. But when it comes to the actual acceleration, Hundred and eighty-one horsepower is 
more than enough for this car. The short gearing really makes this feel peppy until you hit like 60, 70 miles per hour. That's when most other performance cars in this price bracket begin to pull away. While the Civic Type R does feel more potent in every part of the rev range, unless you've made a clinical grade oopsie, the roof of the Honda does not come off. It makes you feel like you're a part of the scenery, even a little bit more so with the soft top, which is actually the car that I will be buying. This is a press car, I'll explain why later. With the RF or the rag top, the experience is so pure that no amount of lap time or speed could sway my opinion in which one I think is more fun. So that's why I found it to be better to drive than the Civic Type R. But there's a few more reasons why I chose a Miata. The next big one is simplicity. While I trust that Honda can make a durable, forced induction engine, the extra layer of complexity has removed some of the character. Plus, I like that there's no fake engine noise playing through the speakers. I like that there's no electronic parking brake. I like that there's no adaptive dampening. And I like that there's no sport mode. This is down to clown 24 seven. The only thing that you can do is put it into its foolish mode or new foolish mode with restraint. And then there's the cost to run it. While both cars had purchase prices below my original budget, the cost of fuel, tires, brakes are much cheaper with the MX-5. Those things rack up and eventually I do hope to buy another car that I can put miles on and going with the MX-5 will help me do that sooner. Let's get to the actual reality of living with one. First, hopping into the Miata requires a deep squat. And at six foot three, no matter if you go with the hard top or the soft top, headroom for tall folks is gonna be limited. And as will knee room. In fact, in order for me to fit right, I need to make sure that the seat is tilted forward. That way I can slide back as far as I can. Still, I think this is more tall person friendly than you might think, so long as you have a more slender, less glute heavy build. And I found the support from the seats to be sufficient for three hour journeys. I might slightly prefer the Recaros, which have more bolstering, but either work. And I'm a fan of the no frills infotainment, even if it requires a little ergonomic compromise with my wrist. You can use it as a touchscreen, but only in CarPlay. And despite having more modest materials, the quality is top notch. But before I get carried away, we need to talk about these drawbacks. The other big one here is the lack of storage. The trunk, maybe it's bigger than you would think, but still you can really forget about any bulky items. And storage on the inside is largely limited to some cubbies behind you and a couple of flimsy but movable cup holders. Cars like the Honda Civic Type R or even the Toyota GR86 give you more breathing room. And while those are not quiet on the highway, they're much more tolerable than the MX-5. At least the suspension is forgiving. I think the Miata is surprisingly compliant on a bad road, though it does get choppy. You feel every last bit of the pavement, which is a good thing in a lot of cases, but it can grow tiresome. Taking this on long journeys will be a burden, and I just don't know how well I'm going to be able to tolerate living with this, which is why I was so close to buying a Type R. The reason why the Honda wasn't my final answer was because the most important thing to me was how special the car was to drive. And you're just not beating this. You might not even beat it if you have a lot of money. For me, most other aspects of the vehicle didn't need to be great or even good, just sufficient. It's less, is this the car that I really want to live with? And more, can I live with this car? Because I have access to press cars roughly half of the year, I won't have to rely solely on the MX-5. But even if I had a different job, I'm not sure that would have changed my decision this time around. Something this lightweight, this focused on fun, I don't know if we'll be able to buy a car like this very soon. And that was why I was making the series to begin with. I didn't just want to buy a car, I wanted to buy an experience. And that is what you're getting with the MX-5. Maybe I will buy a Type R someday, but that time has not come just yet.
So where's my car? Well, I tried to buy one, but the problem was is that I wanted a Grand Touring and I wanted it with the red and I wanted it with the manual transmission and there just wasn't really any at all. I sat around waiting and then when one would pop up within a 200, 300 mile radius, I'd call the dealership and usually they knew that they had some leverage against me. So they were offering me two, three grand below what the book value was of the GR Corolla. And I'm not doing that. Like I, when I bought the Corolla, I bought it because I wanted to be one of the first to make videos on it. It was definitely a personal, emotional choice as well, but it was a business decision too. This, not so much. I'm not in a hurry. There's already a bajillion videos out on the MX-5 and when I get it, I'm not gonna make a ton of content on it. Like I wanna film one really good review with it I want to film maybe some long-term ownership impressions, but this one is definitely more personal. Last time when I bought the GR Corolla, I paid a couple grand over sticker. This time my goal is to pay below MSRP and my local dealer will happily do that for me and they'll give me what the Toyota is worth. But the problem is, is that they're gonna to have to order the car. And at this point, this late in the year, I'm just gonna to try to order a 2025 which means I should be able to spec out the car in the next couple of months to take delivery in the spring. Until then, I'll enjoy my last winter with the snow happy GR Corolla. Thank you for making this purchase and the last a reality. Maybe I'm beginning to sound repetitive, but I never thought that I'd be able to take the channel this far and that would have not been possible without the regular viewers and channel supporters. I'll catch you in the next one.